Thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. Um, those of you who are here in person and the many of you on Zoom. And I wanna thank Mirabella for hosting us. Mirabella is a, a university-based retirement community and the first one in the country to be uh, on a university campus. Um, and their uh, goal clearly already achieved is lifelong learning and also to leverage the experience of the people here to enrich the lives of students and all of the ASU community. So thank you Mirabella for hosting us. Uh, this event uh, across the aisle and across the century with State Senators Paul Boyer and Sean Bowie is part of Arizona State University's first ever Humanities Week. And a few days ago, I mentioned to my son, who is a newly minted aerospace engineer, that I was going to moderate an event that brought together the humanities and contemporary American politics. And there was a little pause over the phone line. And then he kind of gently said, do you think anyone will go? <laughs> so I have to admit, I knew what he meant. Um, I think the humanities uh, seem to have a reputation at the moment as at best hopelessly impractical. Um, and at worst, especially when it comes to my own field of American history, kind of connoisseurs of complaint uh, or elitist naysayers. And politics, can also seem in recent years or has a reputation as uh, being impractical or paralyzed, and in some senses to have emerged from our, our darker impulses. Um, but you have come, my son needn't have worried. Um, and it's, I think, because we know that the fact that the humanities and politics acknowledge um, people's and society's flaws is their strength. As the philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote, from the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing has ever been made. And the humanities bear witness to that crooked timber, brain, tree, forest, and they find meaning and even beauty in it. And politicians do more than that. Uh, Kant, uh, not a philosopher, I'm an historian, so I'm gonna tell you what year he wrote that. Uh, 1784, which is the year right after the Treaty of Paris brought into existence the American Republic, which our two speakers serve. Um, and Kant wrote that line as part of a cautiously optimistic set of propositions on, among other things, how perhaps a better world might come to exist through politics, if politicians are both just and fully human. So Senator Bowie and Senator Boyer have taken up the call to build with the crooked timber that is us, um, taken the call up gallantly, I would, I would say. Uh, and they both turn to the humanities to sustain them as they do that. So we're just really honored to have them in conversation with us tonight. And State Senator Sean Bowie uh, is a proud product of Tempe Public Schools and then of ASU, where he got a degrees in political science and history, then a master's degree in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon, worked as a management consultant, globetrotter, I believe, uh, then came home to us working for the provost's office. And there he worked on issues of equity, it's fair to say, right, and inclusion. Uh, since being elected to the Senate in 2016, Sean has worked on public school issues, on mental health issues, on community safety issues. Um, and I must also tell you that many years ago, when Sean was a brilliant undergraduate, and I was, if anything, more earnest and awkward than I am now as an assistant professor, he wrote a terrific honors thesis about Alexander Hamilton. So I just need you to know that first there was Sean Bowie, only later was there Lin-Manuel Miranda. That is the order. So State Senator Paul Boyer is in his sixth year at the state legislature with the last three as a state senator uh, representing Glendale and North Phoenix. And he has taught high school literature for the last seven years along with Latin. He holds a BA in English from ASU, an MA in Communication Studies from ASU, and will graduate with an MA in the Humanities from the University of Dallas next spring, where he is also learning ancient Greek. And he did arrive with his Plato in hand, and I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. 
Paul's thesis argues that every interaction Socrates has with his interlocutors is one of care, where he utilizes rhetoric as soul leading to guide them to the truth or to what is. And he and his wife have been married for six years and they have a two and a half year old and a dog. <laughs> All right, so there we are. So they are here as senators and as human beings to talk to us about how they think and how they do their work. Uh, one is a Republican and one is a Democrat. So on, on the issue of agreement and disagreement, I think we can start off by noting that you two have quite different views of what government is and what it should do. Um, and I think both of you draw on history and perhaps on literature to nurture and shape those views. So, Senator Bowie, why don't you just tell us what you think? Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here in person. For those of you watching over Zoom, uh, I was a history major here at ASU um, not too long ago. Um, you know, and, and Paul's, you know, training and his interest is more in the classics, and I was more interested in the founding and American history and you know, I was able to name all the US presidents and read a lot of biographies of presidents. And I was always interested in learning about how the country was founded and how politics have changed, obviously have changed quite a bit over the years. And for me, you know, when you look at the founding, I think it's a good example because you kind of had two different experiments of the debate that we're still having today, more, you know, states' rights, um, less government at the federal level versus a stronger national government. Um, we saw that with the Articles of Federation. Um, and then we saw, you know, during the war, you had Washington, Hamilton, and many others who grew very uh, frustrated with that system of government. It had states who were minting their own currencies, they had their own armies, um, they struggled with that. So when the war was over and Washington became president, Hamilton was the treasury secretary, you know, they, they were informed by that view of the war, whereas you had folks like Jefferson, who was in France, who didn't have that same experience. So we still have that debate today. Uh, should we have a stronger national government? Should it be more states' rights? You know, and for me, when I approach my job, I try to look at things as, you know, is it a federal issue? Is it a state issue? Is it a local issue? And while it might be tempting to say, well, I'm a state legislator, so everything should be a state issue, I'm also cognizant that there are things that are better solved at the local level, and there are things that are better solved at the federal level. So for me, I, I kind of take that training, what I know about history, uh, from early U.S. history up to today, try to look at what's happened and try to use it to help inform my decisions about what direction we should take the state. So there's lots of issues that we can talk about, but that's kind of a short overview of kind of how I approach that and how I use history and the humanities to kind of inform my thought process at the Capitol. Well, when I got elected, um, I took a huge pay cut. And uh, fortuitously, I, I fell into teaching because I needed to work. And um, uh, there was a school called Veritas Prep that was hiring. And so they interviewed me. And uh, so that year, I, I taught 10th grade. And that was modern European history, along with 10 great books. And, and what astounded me, what, what I wasn't aware of, having only probably at the time a superficial understanding of American history, how much the founders were influenced by European history. and, and uh, European thinkers, the Enlightenment, uh, John Locke in particular, uh, how much the uh, English Bill of Rights from 1689 impacted kind of how we do business today and how uh, the king just can't come in and arrest you if you say something offensive on the, on the floor of parliament. <laughs> and, and so things like that just started to reverberate with me that, wow, um, they really, I, I guess I wanted to go uh, at Fontes or to the sources. And so that's when I started uh, looking at Locke, Rousseau, Hobbes, but really I went back even further and now I'm kind of a, a classic snob where a, a good friend of mine said, oh, well, hey, I, I read some C.S. Lewis recently and I'm like, yeah, he's too modern for me. <laughs> and, and I love Lewis, but I, I love Cicero even more. <laughs> and, and so for me, yeah, I, I think probably that the person that I do look up to the most, look back to the most is, is Cicero. I'm still bitter at Caesar Augustus for uh, killing Cicero <laughs> because really the world uh, was at poverty, I think, when, when we lost him. Um, he, he fought to protect the Republic and he was um, a Roman consul, which was the highest uh, form, you know, the, the highest 
apex of, of government at the time in the world at the time. And he just got there as a new man. He didn't have a name. He didn't have uh, money. He, he married uh, well. And so he, he, he um, was able to become a senator that way. But he, uh, just through sheer talent and ambition, he was able to rise to the highest heights of power. And, and he, he tried desperately to uh, maintain the republic. And he could have joined the triumvirate. He could have joined uh, Crassus, Pompey, and, and Julius Caesar, but because he saw that they wanted to get rid of the Republic and they wanted to be more, um, well, in my opinion, tyrannical, that he rejected Julius Caesar. Caesar had some very uh, nice things to say about Cicero. He said that whereas I have increased um, the Roman, essentially the geography, I mean, he's, he conquered a lot of peoples, uh, Cicero has increased the Roman spirit. And he did that through uh, the Latin language and just the way that he uh, could, could turn a phrase. I mean, there, there was nobody in my opinion like Cicero. Uh, they, they called him at the time the Greek, which was not a term of endearment, <laughs> but he, he was very uh, erudite. He was very smart, but he also was very practical. I mean, he knew how to win campaigns and he also knew how to, to govern well. And so, uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely somebody that I, I look to. Thank you. So you both kind of mixed in um, individuals and societies and your answer and government. Um, and to follow up on that, there's, a, there's an argument among the founders, which is also an older argument, which is sort of an argument, do, do good men make good governments or do good governments make good men, right? Substitute people for men, perhaps. Uh, so, what is your view there? Do you want, you can put it in a founder's way. Do we need virtuous people for a republic or what is the relationship between virtue and government? Well, if I had to choose, I would say I would want a virtuous citizenry because I, I think that they'll keep the elected officials in check to the point where they wouldn't let them get away with uh, any, any, um, you know, nonsense or anything that they shouldn't be doing while in office. I, I do think that for a Republican in particular, and I, I want to say it's Federalist 55, I don't know if that's Hamilton or it's probably Hamilton. Yeah, where they, he argues that if one is to govern oneself, then one must have virtue. And of course, a republic is a uh, government that is made up of uh, government by the people. And so let me, let me segue real quick to, to the Republic. And so a uh, pledge Republic, of course, uh, Socrates spends about six or seven books talking about, um, they're creating this in speech because they're trying to examine justice. And at the end of, the, uh, of this discussion, it's book nine, if, if you haven't read it, it's fantastic. Uh, Alan Bloom, I think it's the best translation. He says, uh, there, there's a line uh, when he's talking about how the teacher should approach the students. And Socrates says, after we, the teacher, having cared for the best part of ourselves, that we place a republic or a constitution in the student in order that they may be free. What that means is they don't need an external teacher to govern them. They don't need external laws, but they can govern themselves, that they have self-control, that they have virtue, uh, which is really just human excellence, that they have enough virtue where they can govern themselves. And so back to the question, I think, yeah, if I had to choose although it would be great to have uh, virtuous representatives, I think long-term uh, it, it's probably more efficacious to have a virtuous citizenry that will, no matter who's in office, that they'll keep them uh, doing the right thing. I, I would agree with that. Um, we really do need virtuous people running for office and, and holding office. And, you know, it's, Politics, I think we share this opinion, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot more partisan over the years, not just in, in Washington, but um, here at the state level and the local level as well. And, you know, running for the state legislature, you know, it's not the most glamorous position. It doesn't pay very well. Um, we certainly don't do it for the money, um, but convincing people to run, not just for legislature, for city council, for school boards, um, for all these offices. Um, you know, with social media and with everything becoming so much more partisan, it, it's not as appealing. So not having those kind of people running for office, you know, that definitely has an impact. And, you know, someone like me who, you know, is very bipartisan and wants to work with everybody and ran for this job to, you know, to do the work, 
um, it's, it's become harder and harder. And going back to the founding, um, you know, what's interesting about the founding is that if you go back and read the Federalist Papers and you go back and read everything up to 1790, the founders did not want political parties at all. Um, George Washington wrote about it. Um, even Hamilton and Jefferson were getting along at that point. Um, and they said, we've seen this in other countries. Um, this isn't for us. Like this is a new experiment. Um, we're, we're not gonna have parties. And of course it took, I wrote about this in my paper, it took less than two years uh, for us to have parties. And if you've seen the musical Hamilton, it covers it a little bit. Um, there's a line when Jefferson, uh, raise, show of hands, how many of you have seen Hamilton? Oh, Almost Mark. everybody. Um, so there's a line in What Did I Miss, the first song when Jefferson comes on and um, um, I'm trying to remember the exact line. Um, he said, uh, you know, someone came along to resist them, pissed them off until we had a two-party system. Um, that was my Hamilton right there. Um, <laughs> so you had Jefferson and Madison, you know, not liking what Hamilton was doing. Um, Hamilton was expanding the size of the national government. He was creating a national bank. He was assuming state debts. Um, they couldn't really attack Washington because Washington was this exalted figure. So jealous of Hamilton's success, I would argue, um, they formed an opposition movement to Hamilton and they formed a newspaper, a partisan newspaper, you know, the Fox News of its day. Um, and then Hamilton, of course, if you know anything about him, had to start his own paper in response. Uh, and that's, it all came from there. So I think political parties are inevitable um, when we're dealing with decisions that we deal with at the Capitol, when we're deciding how to spend taxpayer dollars, when we're deciding what the role of government is, uh, there are some things that we broadly agree on, but it's the specifics and the details where we disagree. So uh, partisanship and, and political parties are unavoidable, but we do need people running who I think are running for the right reasons, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, because they want to do the work and they want to do what's best for the state, uh, and not so much what's best for their party or their ideology. So much in what you just said. Uh, so to pick up on one thread of it, if you could wave a wand, would you get rid of political parties? Like, can you conceive of the legislature without political parties? <laughs> what would that be? Uh, it's difficult because one would need a very good imagination. <laughs> I mean, when Sean and I, when we both ran for office, I mean, the reality was there are parties, you have to join one of the two parties if you're going to, to win office and if you're going to make a difference. And to my knowledge, I don't know that we've ever had an independent that ever won outright. Maybe somebody switched yeah. to, as an independent. But so I guess the reality for us, I mean, as much as, as we love history, uh, you know, whether that's modern or ancient, um, we know that if we were going to make a difference, then we do have to join a political party. The frustration, I think, for voters and constituents is what we hear all the time is, well, be, we want you to be independent and do what's right regardless. And But there's always this pressure on us, well, you have to be a team player. You have to be part of the caucus. And, and I've realized more than ever this year, <laughs> the price of, of not, quote unquote, being a team player uh, and, you know, the threats of, you know, being primaried and losing the next election when all I'm trying to do is just do what's best for what I think is best for the state of Arizona. And I'll work with anybody regardless of, you know, what party they are. And Sean and I, we worked on uh, ideas in the past. We've killed some bad bills uh, over the years. And uh, I think we're going to continue uh, next year and doing killing some bad bills. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know if you'd be able to get rid of parties. Uh, you know, we have other elected offices like the city council, like here in Tempe, for example, um, it's nonpartisan. Um, but obviously they have their own voter registrations wherever they are individually. Um, yeah, like I said earlier, I think in some sense it's unavoidable. Um, for someone like me, you know, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. I've been a Democrat my whole life. But yeah, I have to remind Democrats in my district, I represent independents and Republicans and libertarians as well. Um, and when I think about my job as a state senator, it's not just about what I think is a good idea. It's about what do I think my constituents think is a good idea. And there's times where there's a bill that, you know, would, would benefit my district specifically, whether it's schools or, or corporations that are there uh, or the cities that I represent, you know, those that carries a lot of weight for me. Um, and we've both gotten a lot of grief from our parties. I'm sure we can share some stories uh, if we have time. Um, but I, I'm someone when I, okay, <laughs> no one's taping this right. Um, so when I first got elected, um, I, 
when I first ran, I, not many, not very many people gave me a chance to win because uh, I, I'm the first Democrat to ever re represent my district in the Senate. It had never been one before. Um, so I came in and won by a small margin and almost immediately started getting grief uh, saying, well, why don't you be a team player? And, you know, we need everyone together on this. And, and my response was usually, well, how did the last Democrat from my district vote on that? <laughs> so I've always just done what I thought is best for my district. I grew up there. I'm a product of the public schools there. I knocked on tens of thousands of doors. I have a pretty good sense of what my constituents, what I think my constituents are looking for. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've won three elections and I've won by a bigger margin each time. So clearly I'm doing something right. Um, but for me, at the end of the day, it goes back to, I represent everyone in my district, regardless of party. I have my own views, but I try as hard as I can to put myself in other people's shoes from other perspectives and make what I think is the best decision for my constituents. So if I can follow up on that last point, I, I've, I've always wondered about kind of the alchemy of representation, right? How do you get from all these individual opinions to your vote? Um, and you presumably exercise your judgment and you clearly also are responsive to your constituents. So I'd, lo I'd love to hear you talk in theory and in practice uh, uh, about maybe moments where you had to really decide how to balance your judgment and sort of the majority view among your constituents. So it's interesting, uh, you know, for folks who watch the state legislature, uh, I would say about 80 to 90% of what we vote on is pretty non-controversial, passes 30 to zero or 29 to one, and it's, you know, standard stuff that doesn't get a lot of um, press attention or coverage. Um, but obviously we have big debates about issues. Um, the state budget is, is one of those. Um, the state budget, you know, I serve in the minority party. So the state budget is usually a party line vote um, because usually the majority doesn't include the minority and they put stuff in there that we don't like. And usually there's a lot of pressure to vote the party line on that and say, uh, no, you might like one of the things in there, but then they're going to say it's a bipartisan budget, so don't vote for it. Uh, I will. So my second year was 2018, um, and that was the Red for Red year, if you all remember that. And um, a lot of folks were upset with the governor and the legislature about education funding. You know, I'm still upset about education funding. I think we need to do a lot more. Um, you know, the governor came out and said, you know, we're going to do a 1% stipend for teachers. Don't, don't spend it all in one place. Um, so then, you know, the governor was up for re-election that year. The whole legislature was up for re-election. So there was a lot of pressure to, to do something because folks wanted to win elections. So we had, what, tens of thousands of folks come to the state capitol. And um, it was an amazing couple of weeks. Um, just people camped out in, in the hallways and in the lobby and um, in the gallery. Um, so eventually the governor said, okay, I said before we couldn't afford more than 1% raise. We're now going to do a 20% raise over three years. So he found the money somewhere. Um, so I saw that and it was going to be a 10% raise the first year, then 5% the next year, and 5% the next year. And I didn't tell him by the time, but as soon as I heard him say that, I said, I have to vote for that because my constituents would want me to vote for it. It's not enough, but it's a step in the right direction. And when I first campaigned, I knocked on 15,000 doors. I lost a lot of weight. I was skinnier back then than I am now. Um, and every door I knocked on, I said, I want to bring bipartisanship back to the state capitol and I want to restore education funding. So doing that does both of those things. Voting for that budget does both of those things. So I got a lot of heat for it from my caucus. Uh, we ended up voting on the budget at four o'clock in the morning. Um, I was the first Democrat to get up and explain my vote and say, you know, I'm thinking about the schools that I went to growing up. I'm thinking about my teachers, support staff, students. Um, this is the right thing to do. And I voted for it um, and was one of only four Democrats to vote for it. Um, and I still think it's the right decision to this day. We haven't done enough, but it was a step in the right direction. I, I thought I'm in the minority. My influence here is somewhat limited. I would like more, but this is as good as we're going to get and I'm going to support it. So that's just one of many examples. If we have more time, I can share more. I'll just piggyback on that. I mean, how, how does one faithfully represent one's constituency? I mean, we are a representative government and in, in our districts, we're both in competitive districts 
And so there's not a huge, you know, Republican or Democratic swing. And so it's tough. And, and I'm not, I don't always get it right. Um, I, I think that my voters and I knocked on a lot of doors as well. I, I used to sell bookstore door so I was used to getting rejected and some used to knock it on doors. And, you know, my, my voters knew what they were getting uh, when they elected me. Um, you know, they knew I cared about education. They knew I, I, I'm a teacher and they knew that I really care about public safety. And, and those are really two issues that I think for the most part, if, if you take away the partisanship and the extremes on either side, that, that most of my constituents will agree with. Now, of course, there'll be disagreement on how we get there and what's the best way to get there. But I, I guess to answer your question, is, it's hard and I don't always get it right. Um, but I hope that I do faithfully uh, represent my constituency, even when um, some of the louder voices uh, say, well, we represent we the people and we the people want you to do X, Y, or Z, which sometimes might be uh, impossible or might be unconstitutional or something that we're just not capable or we're not even allowed, legally allowed to do. <laughs> and then I just try and explain my position as best as I can. I can't resist telling you, Sean, that there are a large group of people that make sure you're eating enough. So, <laughs> yeah, Sean's, I've heard people ask how Sean's doing, how, how his politics are, and always, how does his weight look? Does he appear to be eating enough, especially during campaign season? Right. So, yeah, you, you definitely have people worrying about you. So, you two, you two are friends, um, and you do disagree, and we're not really good at that anymore, right? That, that, that seems to be a skill that many of us have, have lost. So I wonder if you could just tell us stories um, uh, about one or another time when you quite sharply disagreed. And then how, how is it that you then carry on believing in each other's goodwill? I'll let you think of a good story, but I'll just say that I think what Sean and I do well is we focus on the argument, not being argumentative, but we focus on the policy. And I think there are some things where, where Sean will say, I didn't even bother you with asking about this bill because I already know where you stand. But there are some issues where um, he, he'll make a good argument and it's, and it's a good argument and it's persuasive. And that's all I really care about. And that's what I tell my party leadership all the time is if you can persuade me on a good argument on whatever it is you're pushing, then I'll support it. But there's always an expectation while well, you're part of the caucus, so you have to support it. And we're a small caucus, and we have 16 in the Senate, the Republicans, that is. And so it's not that hard to ask, but for some reason, <laughs> they don't ask. And Sean does. And so we talk a lot, and he doesn't always persuade me, but there are many times when, when he does. Uh, I, I guess I'll start with, with an issue that we disagreed with, and that was the scope of the uh, tax cuts on this year's budget. So the original proposal that uh, was being fast-tracked, the governor, the president, the speaker, the majority leader in the House, all these interest groups that, that members, if they want to get reelected, that they listen to, uh, they wanted a $1.9 billion uh, tax cut. Ongoing, this is permanent. This is, um, just to give you some perspective, that was 14% of our state uh, revenue. And in Arizona, uh, it, it takes two thirds in the legislature to raise taxes. And, so, and I don't, I've never, since I've been to the legislature, I've never seen the le this legislature raise taxes. And there might be times when that's needed, when uh, the revenues aren't coming in and maybe it's, a, you know, it's targeted, but there might be a need for that. And so practically it's impossible to raise taxes at the legislature, at least with the current makeup. And so, Sean and I were talking about a $500 million um, ongoing cut and more on the debt side. Well, I was able to get more on debt. Uh, thankfully, we got a $1 billion debt, uh, debt, debt reduction, uh, specifically our public safety retirement, uh, retirement system. I mean, that, that saves a lot of dollars in the long term. But yeah, I think, Sean, you're a little mad at me that <laughs> I ended up ultimately supporting uh, what ended up being a $1.3 billion um, tax, tax cut and just, and I'll start off with my thinking. I think I shared this with you, but my thinking was we were at the very end of the fiscal year. It was starting at late uh, June 20th, June 21st, something like that. And my thought was some kind of a tax cut is going to happen. Uh, my fear was I didn't want to shut down state government because if we don't pass a budget by July 1st, then, you know, things would not be funded. And so talking to economists who didn't have 
clients or skin in the game, but just truly legitimately wanted what was best for the state. Um, just talking to one economist in particular, uh, we landed on a number that, that I was comfortable with, which ended up being, I started at 1.2 billion, ended up being 1.3 billion. And so that's really how we ended up uh, where we did. And I know that, yeah, I'll let you explain yeah, your perspective. It was a very long session. Uh, it was 181 days, which was the third longest session in the history of the state. Um, so yeah, we went until June 29th or June 30th. 29th. Uh, most of that was fighting over the budget. Um, so we, we worked together for quite a long time and I spent more time in his office than any member's office this year by a pretty wide margin. Um, just talking over this and we talked about an alternative. Um, I understand where you're coming from. Um, he made a point, it takes a two thirds majority to raise taxes, but it only takes a simple majority to cut taxes. So there you go. Um, so my concern was, you know, we have a lot of areas of the state budget like higher education. Arizona has cut more from higher education than the state in the country since the recession. We were able to get some investments in higher education and then fall was a big part of that. Um, but we still have a long ways to go. We don't fund our community colleges at the state level at all. You know, financial aid, we don't have a statewide financial aid funding program. So I, I could go on for a while, but um, things where we disagreed, um, you know, Paul, you know, a lot of folks say, well, well, Paul's a moderate. I mean, Paul is pretty conservative. And, uh, you know, he, there's some issues where I just know, like, I know Paul and I are going to disagree. So let's save our energy for some of the issues that are kind of more of in the middle where we might find um, agreement. Um, one issue that I know we disagreed on, um, which we had a couple spirited discussions about, um, was K-12 um, ESAs and Harvard Scholarship accounts. And um, Paul had a bill to expand those, um, which I had some issues with. Um, so we had a couple conversations just uh, talking about where you were coming from, where I was coming from, and I think that bill didn't get through the house, right? Um, so he might bring it back again next year, but um, that was one area where we disagreed. But we were friendly about it, and obviously we're here today, and uh, we're not mad at each other. So. If we're a spirited conversation, do you like shout Hamilton quotes at each other? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will say, though, uh, on our desks on the Senate floor, we can uh, put things on our desks uh, to decorate them. Like folks will have a lot of folks will have donkeys or elephants or Democrats or Republicans or pictures of you know their families. Um, I've since day one had a bottle head of Alexander Hamilton on my desk, um, and Paul has a bust of Thomas Jefferson on his desk, and he sits behind me now to the right. Um, so he sat next to me our first two years in the Senate. And we just started talking about Hamilton and Jefferson, and um, that kind of you know started this uh, conversation and leading to today. So, yeah. So what I'll do is, if if I'm uh, fresher with Sean, then I'll I'll point Jefferson at him because I know how much he despises Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> I don't despise him. <laughs> don't despise him. But. You point Jefferson at him. I do. That is definitely. <laughs> Um, so on the subject of vicious partisanship, such as Jefferson pointing, um, you, you, you both are um, uh, seasoned, uh, but somewhat young statesmen. Um, and my sense from both of you is that in your uh, time, you already see partisanship as becoming more extreme and problematic. Um, so I think I, I, maybe a lot of us have a sense of what it's like to, to watch that. But I have no sense of what it's like to try to live within that right, all the time and how difficult that must be. Um, so just just tell us a, a, about how you experience this increase in partisanship as, as politicians and as people. So this year in particular has been probably the toughest year that I've ever had uh, because of the, the audit that's been going on since uh, February or whatever it was. And when I voted no on jailing the category of supervisors for following the law, I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get there. And I was the only person in my caucus um, that, that made that no vote. And the emails, the phone calls, the text messages that I get um, are pretty disgusting. Um, having to the night of the vote, having to, to stay in different locations for a few nights uh, with my wife and kid. Uh, I never thought in a million years that I would um, have to experience that, that I'd have to worry about the safety of my family because of a vote that I took. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's gotten that bad. And I mean, I could diagnose and maybe tell you what, where I think it's coming from. I, perhaps that uh, social media with 
with Facebook and even Google only pushing um, articles that one already agrees with. And so when you talk to people, they, they think you're, you're, you're from Mars <laughs> if you have another perspective. Well, because all they're taking in are, are things that, that essentially they're already agreeing with. And so um, I don't know if you're looking for solutions, but it's what, what I find works is I'll get emails and I respond all the time. My assistant laughs at me because she, she likes to read my responses to constituents and I'll even respond to people from out of state. And, and I, what I find is when I, when I engage personally and I explain my rationale and I ask them questions, I'll say, have you considered this? Have you considered uh, partisan auditors who are funded by partisans who have already declared the outcome? Uh, would you like them auditing uh, something that, that you're working on? Probably not. Uh, wouldn't you want someone who truly just says, here's the numbers, do what you want with it? You know, when I start asking questions like that, I even had one guy from Texas who now wants to take me out to lunch. When he started off by calling me a rhino, you know, Republican name only, hack. And, and I said, you know, and I responded with just a link to how to win friends and influence people. And he responded, he's like, haha, that's funny. And I wrote back, I said, why do you think that I'm joking? I go, no, really, I, I think you should reflect on what you said to a perfect stranger, read this, think about it, and then get back to me. And so he, he responded and he's like, oh, you know, I, I thought I was a staffer. I thought it was kind of cute, but um, I've already read it. <laughs> and, he, and then he, he uh, after I asked him all those questions at some point, he said, you know what? I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't pray before I sent the email and I thought about it and you're right. And I'm sorry, uh, will you please forgive me? And my wife and I come to uh, watch baseball in the spring and I'd love to take you out. And so I just find that when there's personal engagement, but the difficulty is we have such a large constituency. I mean, we represent, a, it's one of the largest in, in the country. Uh, I think we represent around 240,000 uh, individuals and obviously you can't get to everybody. Can, can I just, um, how do you find the wherewithal to continue to answer all of those? E emails. Where does that come from? I guess just a, a dogged pursuit of the truth. And I mean, obviously I only have enough time in the day. Uh, I, I probably spend way more time responding than, than maybe I even need to. But I don't know. I, I, I guess Socrates is a personal hero and, and he's so persistent <laughs> with, with people that he genuinely, I believe, and that's my, my thesis, that's my argument, is that every interaction he has with his interlocutors, even, uh, I'll have to even make the argument, Anatus and Miletus that end up getting him killed. Um, I, I think he, he ultimately cares about the state of their souls. And so for me, uh, I'll respond and the individual might think that I'm being brash or arrogant or uh, confrontational, but I legitimately, I mean, even though I don't know them, I, I want them to see that there's more to the story than just what they've been spoon-fed by whatever organization or news network they're looking at. I respond to emails too. I may not respond to the ones from Texas or Florida, but um, I always tell folks, you know, when I talk to kids and in schools or when I, I talk to folks who are always ask us, well, how can we have an impact? You know, uh, people assume we have these big staffs and, and we don't, we have an assistant and that's it. Um, you know, for me, if it's a personalized email, if they're a constituent, then Obviously, I'm going to respond to that and do everything I can um, to help them. Um, but as far as what was the original question, partisanship? Yeah, partisanship getting worse. Yeah, and for me, you know, since day one, I my approach has always been, you know, I can do my job better and more effectively if I work with people. Um, you know, it's it's very easy just to be a bomb thrower and uh, you know throw bombs at the other side and criticize them and. You get likes and, and followers, um, but that doesn't help me do my job. Um, you know, the, the Senate uh, is 1614 right now, um, 16 Republicans, 14 Democrats, and uh, you need 16 votes to get anything done. So oftentimes it could be a difference of one or two votes that determine laws for the whole state. So I've been successful in, in not only getting uh, laws signed, uh, bills signed into law, but also getting things in the budget and, and working on larger issues. Uh, because of my approach. So I, I, we definitely have colleagues, we won't name names, um, who are more bomb throwers and, and that's kind of their style and then maybe their districts want them to do that because they're either safely uh, Republican or safely Democratic. But for me, I just think if I'm, if I'm gonna do my job effectively and represent all my constituents, um, you know, it helps to work with people. I can still have the same views as somebody else, 
but I'm not on Twitter, you know, going after the other side. I think, you know, when Donald Trump was president, I don't think I tweeted about him once. Like, how does it help me do my job to, you know, talk about something that's happening at the federal level? Uh, I'm going to put my head down and focus on doing the work at the state level. And I just think that's the best way to govern. And I think, you know, Paul um, feels that way as well. So one, one argument is that term limits might um, improve the quality of politics or that term limits are an extension of what the framers would have wanted. Um, so whether in the context of partisanship or just doing one's job, uh, what do you think about term limits? I'm gonna start with, and I'll let Sean uh, talk about the founders. That's his specialty area. Um, <laughs> But I'll start with the not the, the not the non-populist view, <laughs> and, and that's uh, as legislators. Uh, some of us have term limits in Arizona. It's you can serve eight years uh, in in either chamber, and then you'd have to either leave or you can switch uh, chambers. So technically, we have term limits, but we really don't. I mean, you you can switch you know eight years, eight years, and until you die. Um, here's something to consider anytime you're considering term limits. Um, some members might argue, well, there's term limits every two years, I mean, every election. But the, the people that don't have term limits are the lobbyists. There, there's nothing in the Constitution or in state law that says, you know, they can only work as a lobbyist for so many years. And so what I've seen, having been around a little while, I used to be on staff, um, I started in 2008. And so I've, I've been at the legislature in some form or fashion for a while. And what I found is lobbyists will have really bad ideas and they'll go to the freshman who's the newbie who doesn't know any better and say, hey, here you go, <laughs> run this. And they won't couch it this way. They'll say, but here's this terrible idea that never worked um, because other members saw through and saw how bad it was. But here you go. I'll provide everything you need and we'll get it through. And so that's, I guess, just a consideration. Um, I, I generally, I mean, I support the Congressional Term Limits Pledge because I do think it's good to get new, new members in, but just keep that as a consideration as you're considering uh, term limits. I might disagree here a little bit. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of term limits. Uh, we do have term limits at the legislature. You can serve eight consecutive years and then have to switch. Um, I support term limits at all levels of government. Um, here in the city of Tempe, they don't have term limits for the city council, which I've talked to the mayor about. I think that might change soon, but uh, I think they should put in term limits as well. Um, what, what happens a lot in states, and you see this in Congress, you know, what's the average age for a congressman? 82? Because uh, they just, I mean, Chuck Grassley, the senator from Iowa, is like 88, and he's like, yeah, I'm running for re-election for a six-year term. Like, you're going to be 95 by the time your term is up. Um, so what you see in other states, too, where they don't have term limits for legislature is it's a lot of old men in their 70s. And, you know, it's good to have some old men in their 70s, but not all of them, right? Right, right. Fair point. Fair point. Um, the diversity, I think, is a good thing. And I, I love my job. Um, it's the best job I've ever had. But... I don't want to deny other people an opportunity to serve as well and stay there too long. I mean, I'm in my fifth year and I'm like, oh, am I staying too long? You know, should I let somebody else have an opportunity? Um, so I think it leads to more women serving. I think it leads to more people of color serving because you have seats opening up more regularly. And I think that can be new perspectives, new energy, you know, millennials coming. I'm a millennial. There's a few of us that are at the legislature. So I think new people coming in is good for the system. If it's just folks who have been there a long time, I think it changes the issues that are brought up, the bills that are introduced. So I, I'm in favor of having a broad mix of ages. So everyone is represented. Um, and having term limits, I think, Keep helps trying, with that. <laughs> I, I, I will say, though, just to talk about Hamilton for a second. So Alexander Hamilton was not perfect. He had some views that I think were not smart ones. Um, he thought the president should serve for life yeah. under good behavior. So I obviously disagree with that. But um, Term limits are good. Yeah. Can I add on to that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what I would re highly recommend, and, and the difficulty is finding uh, this man or woman who's in office, but when you find somebody good who's there for the right reasons, who doesn't want to tear down but wants to build up, I, I would say keep that person for as long as you can. I've always uh, loved Senator John Kyle, and I just I wished he would have ran for president. I wished he would have continued serving. Um, that's just my opinion. 
Um, I, I would have supported him probably till in his 82, 82nd <laughs> birthday. Um, but, but I think that the broader point is uh, Socrates makes a point. I think it's in Book Five of the Republic. The best leaders are the ones who want to lead least. And he provides the ship of state analogy where he says, the one who knows, the one who knows how to steer the ship uh, is considered the stargazer. They're the ones who are always looking up and it's the, the sailor who convinces the other sailors to, to vote for him to lead the ship when he might not even know what he's doing, but he's better at persuading others to vote for him, to, to get him you know, to, in a position of leadership. And so I, I guess the difficulty though is, and, and Plato struggled with this in Syracuse. I mean, he couldn't, when he tried it, it was a disaster when he tried to get involved practically in politics. But I guess the broader point is when you find a good candidate, um, stick with them. And whether or not there are term limits, I, I just think that good people in office are so hard to find, come by and it's so hard to convince good people who want to be there for the right reasons to run, to A, to run and to win and to continue taking the slings and arrows. There's a lot of, in politics, this idea, and this shows up in the Republic as well a lot, this idea of seeming versus being. Right. Every legislator wants to seem like they're doing, you know, they take the selfies and they run everywhere and they go to every event. And I'm fighting for, you know, the people uh, versus the ones who are putting their heads down, getting their work done. But they're, and they're not really good at, you know, uh, popular, uh, you know, telegraphing to the world, you know, what it is exactly that they're doing. And so I don't know, it's a fine balance of. Um, saying what you've done, uh, whereas I'd rather just get good policy through and, and call it a day versus, you know, focusing on, you know, well, make sure everybody knows that I passed Senate bill, whatever. And so, I don't know, it's, it's, it's obviously a, a, a tough line to, to find. You both talked about knocking on tens of thousands of doors, and you just mentioned that you don't always like having to explain yourself or having to promote yourself. And Sean, if I may, when I knew you when you were younger, you were fairly quiet, um, fairly introspective. I didn't look at you and think, this is a young man who's going to willingly knock on 10,000 right. doors. Right. Um, so I'm wondering, like, how how do you, I don't know, how do you get yourself ready for a campaign? How do you think I'm going to introduce myself to all of these people? I am going to sell myself, right? Or I'm going to market myself, even though that's not my inclination. How do you, as reflective, modest people, become your own flag waver? Yeah, it was hard. Uh, you know, I had spent a lot of years helping other people get elected. Um, and knocking on doors for them and you know, knocking doors for someone else was no problem. Um, but then when I decided, you know, to run, uh, it was scary. It was different knocking on doors for myself. I remember the first time that I went out to go knock on doors for myself. I had literature with my face on it, my name on it. Um, I was terrified. I remember sitting in my car, driving to the neighborhood, sitting in the car, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't get out of the car because I didn't have the confidence to put myself out there and talk about myself. So it took some time. Um, the thought of me running for office for a long time isn't something I thought about because I didn't think I had the self-confidence to do it. Um, but eventually I just kept at it and got better as time went along. I mean, if you had seen me speak at my first kickoff event, it was not pretty because I <laughs> wasn't a good public speaker yet. But um, yeah, eventually I, I developed that confidence and just worked really hard. and. Um, now it's second nature, but in, in terms of marketing yourself, um, you do have to be humble. You do have to um, consider a lot of things when you're doing that. But it, it definitely was an experience getting to that point. And then governing for me was the really exciting part. That's what I ran for office to do was to govern. The campaigning was, okay, I'm not comfortable doing this. I feel like I'm bothering. Like Even to this day, I knock on doors and it's I, I have to restrain myself and saying, hi, sorry to bother you. Um, <laughs> no, I'm there to, to talk to them. So um, I enjoy it. I, I've always enjoyed knocking on doors. We couldn't really do it last year because of COVID. So I, I missed I missed that. I didn't think I would, but I missed just talking to people on the door. door. For me, I, I genuinely enjoy uh, dialogue. I, I enjoy talking to constituents. Even if I disagree with my campaign consultant, he always gets mad at me because he's like, Lori, you can't stay at that same house for half an hour. <laughs> I mean, the, either they, they're going to vote for you or they're not. And you, they're, you're, it's clear they're not going to vote for you. So you shouldn't, you know, keep keep talking to them and, you know, just say, hey, 
thanks. Um, you know, if you have any other questions, uh, my, my website's right here, you know, take a look and I got to go catch as many people as I can. I and mean, that's what he always recommends me to do. And funny enough, um, this last cycle, um, the, the previous one, I think they spent about 20,000 against me in this last cycle, they spent 1.7 million. And so, um, obviously I had to raise a lot more money than I, than I ever did in my campaign campaign consulting. He got mad at me at one point because I, I've been volunteering in Mexico for about eight years, I'm um, building homes and part of a, a wonderful organization and growing up, I never thought I would be a homeowner. And so just being able to build a home and it's obviously it's not, uh, up to code, <laughs> but it's, it's a shelter and, and compared to what, um, you know, these folks have right now, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, they're crying and they're just so grateful and just being able to be a part of that. And he's like, why didn't you tell me that I've known you for years? And, and I never told him just because there's some things that I don't like to politicize. And that's one of them. Uh, but he's like, that would have really helped with this. And he was trying to micro target some certain population. And I, I just, I don't know, it's just not my thing, but um, yeah, just, but getting to be able to talk to as many people as possible, but there's just so little time uh, to do that these days. Yeah. Want to take questions uh, from the audience? Are we are we there now? Okay, perfect. Um, so they'll collect questions, and uh, there are question cards that you can write questions on. Yes, there are <laughs> question cards that you can write questions on. Um, so while they're passing those out, um, is there anything we can do to make your lives better? I mean, uh, just, just listening to kind of the struggle of two people who want to, to work in government and who want to serve and who I think are, are, are suffering a bit because of the partisanship. Uh, is there something that non-politicians you think can do to Mend the body politic, if not heal it. I'll, I'll take a stab at this, and it's obviously it'll be long term, given you know what I'm about to say. I, I really think that what ails us is social media, which I blame a lot. Um, some of the news networks, I, I don't have good cable news, so I don't even watch Fox or CNN. But I, I really think the long term fix is our education system. And what I guess I'd like to see is students less on devices and more uh, engagement with actual real physical books <laughs> and discussion. And, and I've been fortunate enough uh, for the last seven years to um, have a two hour seminar discussion with my students every single morning about history or about uh, a great book that we're, that we're reading. And we read the entirety of, of these um, great texts, except for they said is it Thucydides and Herodotus just because they're way too long. Um, but, you know, The Republic, Aristotle's Ethics, um, Dante's Comedy, um, you name it, we, we read it. And I, I just think the ability to have civil disagreements, you know, my students, you know, we'll read Marx. We'll even read the Comics Manifesto that's part of the curriculum. Um, personally, I don't like Marx, uh, but I think that we need to understand the Comics Manifesto to understand modern economics. And so, and I always have students that, that walk into to the discussion with preconceived notions, either for or against. And I say, okay, before you give me your opinion, let's at least try and understand what he's saying. And then you can, you know, pr provide your opinion. That's fine. And so I, I think the, the long-term fix is supporting anybody who's willing to have that kind of educational approach and not a um, very narrow-minded, well, my way or the highway, or even just a emphasis on so, uh, social media and, and devices in the classroom. And if I was king for a day, what I would do is I would ban devices in every classroom. That's it, maybe I'm anachronistic and an old soul in that respect, but I just think it's a lot easier when, when as a teacher, we're not competing with devices. Could be a billion there for next year. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, you know, I try to do this, but obviously I'm not perfect, but as far as what people can do, I think stepping outside of your comfort zone and talking to people who think differently than you or reading a book or, or a magazine. And, you know, if you get your news from one source, try to just step out and, and not opinion, but just um, getting information from other sources and developing relationships with people that disagree with you, I think is really important. And I'll bring up a philosophical quote. I think it was John Stuart Mill who said this. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but he said, you know, the only way to truly understand an issue is to think about it from every 
direction, every degree it can be understood. And until you think about it from all of those perspectives, you don't really understand an issue. So when we're dealing with bills at the state capitol, you know, I constantly try to put myself in other people's shoes, whether they're different politically, uh, if it's women, if it's people of color, if it's young people or older people, I, I try to put myself in their shoes and think, okay, I might think this is a good idea or a bad idea, but how is it thought of by other people who've had different experiences? So I think the more that we can do that and just befriend people who are different and think differently and have those conversations, I think is really important because with all the partisanship that we have today, folks just aren't talking to one another. And I'm not saying that's gonna solve everything, but I think it can at least help in bridging people together, having those conversations. And I think long-term, I, I think that can help. That's the humanities and politics right there. So we have wonderful questions um, and you'll just wave at me when we're out of time because I have no watch because that's who I am. Um, so here's a straightforward one. Is the Electoral College still an effective and legitimate way of electing the president? So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. That, that's something we've had since the founding or close to the founding, yeah. Um, you know, again, it's become partisan because we had this system, I mean, 2000 wasn't the first time you had someone win the popular vote, lose the electoral vote, I think it was 1876. Uh, what one was the other time? I can't remember, uh, but it happened a couple of times and it's happened twice in the last 20 years. But the problem is, is that it's hurt one party and it's helped the other party. So the party that's been hurt is gonna say, well, we should get rid of that and go to a popular vote because we would have won. And the party that it favored said, well, no, we would have lost if it was a popular vote and we won because of electoral college. Um, so until it hurts both parties equally, I don't think you're gonna have much of a drive for change. So I would like to think that we should have a system where if one candidate gets the majority of votes or more people want that person, that person should win. That sounds reasonable to me. Um, in 2016, um, you know, the president lost by 3 million votes and he still became president. So if that happened the other way, but they still feel the same way about the electoral college. So I don't have a strong opinion either way, but I think having a more fair system um, would probably be a good idea. Well, I, for one, am, am grateful we live in a republic and not a democracy. Um, if, if, you, if you read the republic, uh, sorry, I keep harkening back to that, but I do love it. Uh, uh, Socrates is talking about the different types of regimes, but he's really talking about the type of different types of souls that, that one might have. And he talks about a democratic soul. He doesn't talk about a Republican form of government. I, I think, well, I have my own theory on that, but I do think back to the electoral college question. Um, I, I do think it's the best system that we have because I don't want to be flyover country. I don't want candidates to disregard Arizona, disregard Wyoming, disregard, you know, Idaho, and Vermont, and you know, then only focus on really highly populated, densely populated, you know, LA, New York City, and so forth. And I just think it would be campaigning would look a lot different. And you know, Republicans would then change their entire strategy if if the Electoral College was abolished. Uh, but but I do think the founders were wise in that respect in in the way they put it together that to to get the I think the best form of representation. I really do think that the Electoral College is, was a genius uh, proposal. And, and I do think in spite of maybe some hangups that, that, I mean, if I could, I would not make Iowa the first. <laughs> maybe there's another state or maybe there could be a Arizona. rotation, Arizona. Uh, I don't know that we would want that though, given all the attention we've gotten lately. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a better way to implement it, but I still think it's the best. Would you favor public funding of elections to reduce the influence of uh, high spending special interests? They give each other these cryptic smiles, and I don't <laughs> know why. Uh, we do have that a little bit in Arizona. We have a system called clean elections. It's kind of been gutted over the years, but the idea is you know, uh, if you don't want to raise money traditionally, you can uh, get $5 contributions and um, you will then get money from the state. Um, when it was originally conceived, there were matching funds, but there was a Supreme Court case that threw that out. Um, I think it's a it's a nice sounding idea. I think whenever this has come before the Supreme Court, they've kind of shot down the idea of, um, you know, getting rid of private financing of elections. 
Um, so we have different laws by state. Like in Arizona, you know, a lot of people like to say, well, you take, you know, money from corporations. Like we, we legally can't take money from corporations. So there's PACs and there's other things, but each state has its own laws around that. Um, I would be open to the conversation. It would depend on how it would work, but I think any system where it's like all public financing of elections, I think would run into problems with, especially the Supreme Court, um, who would say money is speech and uh, that there has to be some element of that involved um, in the elections. I'll just say the reality in Arizona is we, we actually have gotten some of the more uh, quote unquote extreme, and, and this is from their, their own words. Like I had Al Melvin tell me he wouldn't be at the legislature when he wasn't in at the time without clean elections. <laughs> And, and, you know, he was more on the uber conservative side and, you know, Russell Pierce and, you know, some some of the legislators that that couldn't get support from uh, otherwise that they would just get enough, um, you know, five dollar contributions and, and they could get their name on the ballot. And so I, I think there's pluses and minuses in, in any system. I, I think you need to, again, just go to whoever's the best candidate. So I'll have uh, people criticize me, you know, well, hey, we, you know, we gave you money for your campaign. I'm like, hey, if you don't like the way I vote, then don't. Donate next time. It's very simple. So we have a question. What do you think will be the most important issue facing the Senate? Yeah, next session. Water. Um, I, I don't want to alarm the public, but I do think that, I mean, we're starting to see our first cuts next year. There are three tiers. The first tier are farmers. Uh, they're going to start receiving cuts starting in 2022. And the second round of cuts tier two will be cities, so residents. So you may see some uh, higher utility bills, or you might even see limitations on how much you can you know, fill up your pool or you know, water your front yard and so forth. I hope it doesn't come to that. I know that there are a lot of people smarter than me that are working on this, but right now, I mean, that's, I, I guess you could say I'm a little obsessed about <laughs> water right now because during the interim, I'm just doing, on a fact finding mission. I'm trying to meet with John Kyle. I'm trying to meet with experts who who are have expertise on water because um, we have to address this long term. We've had about 10 years of droughts. Uh, this year we got a lot of water, which is great, but it didn't make up for the last 10 years. And so we need to find a better way to store it. Uh, we need to find maybe desal desalination plants. Uh, maybe they're very expensive and take a lot of energy, but maybe that's uh, the way to do it. I, I don't know, but uh, for me that that's what it is. Yes, water is always in the top three, um, being that we live in a desert and some of the cutbacks that we're expecting. Um, water's up there for me. Uh, voting rights for me is is very high on the list as well. We saw it this last legislative session. Um, there's been a sudden rush for the last couple of years um, to really dramatically change our voting laws in the state, um, going after vote by mail, going after the early voting list and, and making it harder for people to vote, which I obviously have concerns about. So. We dealt with that this last legislative session. Um, we agreed on some things and disagreed on a few things. But um, for me, protecting the right to vote for people who are eligible to vote, not getting rid of early voting, 85% of my constituents vote early. We should not be getting rid of vote by mail. So keep an eye on that. That's going to be one of the dominant issues. Probably the issue you're going to hear most about in the news when we get when we start our next session in January is around voting rights. I'm freelancing a bit going to combine questions because we're almost out of time. Um, so we have a, a few questions that converge on um, you both want, you both believe in the need for a virtuous citizenry. Um, we're not sure we have one. <laughs> um, and what can be done to bring uh, goodness into the legislature with an, a number of compliments sort of suggesting if we had more like you um, in the legislature, it the world might be a better place. So what are your ideas about attracting others to serve in the way you have served? Yeah, so I'm going to develop a, an idea that I brought up earlier on education. Uh, it, it took me, I think, my junior year in college before I ever stumbled upon the four cardinal virtues. Uh, and you know, Cicero talks about that in his last book on duties. That actually, it was a, a text that he wrote to his son, Marcus, um, justice, fortitude, or courage, temperance, and wisdom. And I mean, I don't think that anybody can find anything to disagree <laughs> with those four, but we just don't talk about them. And the founders themselves received a, a, a liberal education and liberal from the Latin liber to liberate, to liberate an education. It's not political. 
Um, they receive the quadrivium, uh, the trivium, so grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And then the quadrivium, you've got astronomy, music, uh, math, and geometry. And I mean, obviously that's not moral per se, but let me, something that astounded me, I went to the, the bookstore here uh, a few weeks ago, and I have a, a soft uh, cover of Euclid's Elements. And I want to get a hard uh, version. I was here for a, a lecture, and I was shocked to find out that in the entire ASU bookstore with the school as large as ASU, they didn't have Euclid. And, and the reason why I, I bring that up is at the end of many of his propositions, he has QED. We've probably heard that before. It, it's quote demonst demonstratum, uh, era demonstratum. It means that which has been demonstrated or proven. And you know, he'll start with common notions. He'll start with uh, things that everyone agrees upon, and he comes to a proof that that you just can't disagree with. You know, Aristotle starts his metaphysics with first principles or things that the, the tiniest, um, the, the lowest common denominators are things that we all agree with, and then get into something that is uh, less knowable, but that could be you know provide a good argument for. And so, I, I think personally, it all comes back to education. Um, the trivium, the quadrivium, uh, all the founders except for what? Not all, I shouldn't say all. Most of the founders except for Washington um, could could read and write in Latin. And and it's not that Latin is something magic. It's but it's it orients the mind to to think in a logical, ordered way. Uh, the, the problem that, that students have, I think, is when we come uh, when we try and teach American students a, a foreign language, is they don't understand English. <laughs> And so wh whether it's French, German, wh whatever, it doesn't matter, but just giving them another, a foreign language. In fact, most of the founders considered uh, Washington illiterate because he couldn't uh, you know, read and, and speak Latin. But I, I do think that education is where it's at. I do think that the Nicomachean Ethics uh, by Aristotle and just a discussion in 11th grade, I'm, I'm fortunate where we get to discuss the virtues and the magnanimity, you know, book, uh, or chapter two or two, four, I forget, one of those two, uh, where he, he goes into detail about the magnanimous man and how it's really the crowning virtue. He has all the other virtues um, that, that he lays out, whether it's liberality and courage and temperance and, and so forth. And so I think harkening back to liberal education, again, not political, but uh, liberating education, liberating education, I, I think that's where it's at. I think civics education is important. I know we passed some laws around that and then having civics be a part of the K-12 curriculum. Um, honestly, we just need more good people running for office. And the legislature is probably not the most appealing destination. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of sacrifices that are involved in this job. Um, you, you really have to change the way you act and you operate and um, you know every, everything you say, everything you've ever done in your life um, can come out. and um, there's a lot of sacrifices to go with it in terms of time and in terms of salary. And, you know, if you're a successful 40 year old and you've got a family and you've got a job, I mean, why give all that up to run for the legislature, right? Um, but for me, what I keep coming back to is I, I love my job and I love it because of the work that I get to do. And I get to represent the community I grew up in and the schools I grew up in and do as much good as I can while I'm there. And you know, now compared to 2017, we have fewer and fewer members there that um, are not overly partisan and who want to work together. And um, that's just becoming rarer and rarer. And I think you can find good people on both sides to run who really want to do it for the right reasons. So I think everyone runs for office, like all of our colleagues, you know, they're there and they want to do what's best for the state. But obviously, we disagree on how to do that. But um, if you know somebody who you think would be a great state representative or state senator, encourage them to run because um, need, we need more good people up there because it's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. I think that is a good note. Um, there are a few questions we didn't get to, but we do have a reception uh, as, as well. So we can continue talking to the senators. And I hope that we can thank them for this conversation and their work. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for coming and thank you shippers for uh, making this possible. <laughs>